Hello there. Welcome to episode 11 of the Attitude Makeover show. I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome Alagu Balaraman, a dear friend and the founder director at Deep Cell, a company that identifies and creates sales opportunities via tech. In my mind, Alagu is known for his unconventional squiggly career that has taken him places. Today he talks about starting out with a traditional career path and the changes thereafter highlighting how all changes really start with an attitude makeover he delves into the idea of career plans in the dynamic economy that we live in marriage of wealth and tech to change career trajectories and creativity in transformation a major highlight of this conversation is a complete tear down of the supply chain concept more specifically focused on india its evolution and its future tune in to this remarkably interesting and informative episode as always i hope you like it hey alugu thank you so much um i know it's through a common friend that we met but i think there's so much common uh having talked to you about our journeys and our aspirations and our experiences as well it's a delight to have you on my show thank you it's a pleasure to be here thank you so i'll start off with uh, something that um, you know i I'll, i'll draw an analogy right um my daughter once was teaching me skateboarding um and i'm shit scared of like you know getting on that and balancing myself and so she said uh, mama you just have to stand and lean forward and i said how will i know how much to lean forward when you just take the plunge you will know how much to lean forward to our conversation just before we started it's about taking risks it's about Absolutely. jumping in and i think we both love the journey we've gone through which is this some call it the squiggly career some call it the career portfolio name it whatever it's not the traditional career path that we've taken and there are nuances to it there's success failure there's money sometimes no money you know you pivot at different points you've gone through this journey as well as a marketing professional consultant hr uh, now your own business um, and advisory a whole lot of things walk me through your journey through a squiggly a squiggly career path and what are some nuances and what's what are some learnings Well um yeah it started off as a very traditional career. Oh, so I did a mechanical engineering degree and then I went and got a job in an engineering firm and I was very much there then after 2 years I said let me go and do an MBA. Mm. Okay. Uh I think it's after that that things started changing because I actually went back to the same company the Larson and Tubro where I worked saying that i want to go back because i intend to start something on my own mm. and i don't want to go and learn a new organization mm. so i was pretty clear when i was leaving business school itself that and this is a long time ago <laughs> that, that i was going to get into uh, something to start up with because i said that's the kind of thing to do so uh, within about a year of joining i had moved out and um, started with uh, in the early 90s with pretty much nothing so we were doing some consulting work some development work etc and then two three of us got together we started a company which was automating manufacturing operations and that kind of went on quite well yeah. and uh, but you could see that the entire entire industrial scenario was changing in technology in the early 90s and it's going to require a substantial amount of funding and so on and this was not the time when you still had a lot of uh, uh venture capital mm. around and we were building a product okay so finally we we dissolved the the partnership and i moved into consulting so i was then in a um advising on technology and to various corporations and it was a mix of business strategy and technology strategy that we were working on So this was when I was in Price Waterhouse Coopers and uh then after a few years of consulting I think what drives these changes is often 
the a combination of hey i've been doing this for some time and let's do something very different yes yes and after having done that i again went back into a startup environment where we were doing marketing work we were early days of using the internet for marketing activities that was an interesting time because we had a mix of tech people and advertising people neither of whom understood the other and we had clients who didn't understand the whole concept at all yeah um, i should call myself the catalyst for them because for them. right that's exactly what so like. we 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 had the advertising people trying to convert the internet into a television show or television ad where we were running on 40 50 kbps internet connections which didn't work and there were only 7 million people on the internet in india at that time so we eventually we, i moved out of that also um and uh, i became a cio in a company because uh, you know after you've advised people for years <laughs> you always have this itching feeling to say let me go and do it myself <laughs> and this thing and uh, that that was fun but um, i continued to carry the um you know kind of a portfolio of business planning and strategy and and so on along with the cio role and um, it was interesting uh, it was um, through the 90s when you were automating stuff sorry this is the early 2000s when you were automating stuff um, there was a lot of new technologies there was a lot of you know the whole concept of middleware and this and that was all coming into play so it was a fun time to be experimenting with things uh, then i kind of left technology entirely behind mm-hmm. and moved into working on supply chains operations um i was also asked to handle business strategy and hr when i moved into britannia uh that was that was a significant change uh, in fact it caused a lot of confusion in the industry because most people assumed i was heading technology when i moved over there and then i had to tell them no nope, the person who heads technology is two rooms away you can go and meet him over there uh but it was a nice nice place to work in there was a lot of uh, scope and improvements that we could do uh and after some years there i kind of went back into consulting and i've been work I had been working with a global consulting firm on supply chains for for about 8 10 years now uh, technically i'm still with the company <clears throat> but uh, we've started up another company which focuses on sales uh because i've never done a product in sales before so we said let's let's try something different over here and we said let's take on a hard problem and see if we can crack it so sales is is a difficult area to work in mm. because it's very human and if you want to automate something meaningfully in sales it has to be something that humans can relate to a lot yeah so it was a very it was another you could say a diversion into a different area in this i think what kind of triggers each one is I like to look for some interesting problem to solve. Okay, it's got to be something uh which is worth doing and investing 3-4 years of your time in. And then after that it should be it should allow me to build on when I'm going to the next area in this. So I personally like this kind of a zigzag journey. Uh, I've never heard the term squiggly career before, but uh, it's okay, that's a nice way to describe it in this. uh but it is uh, it, incidentally i don't think it's very unusual many many of the large corporations would pointedly move yeah. some of their people across very very different functions and businesses so that they had a well rounded perspective of how a business is run and that's useful as a leader as well eventually as against a functional Uh, absolutely person, absolutely right because you've got the experience of the holistic organization in uh, fact many companies face this problem yes. right when they they promote people as experts and specialists they hit a ceiling yeah. uh but they are hesitant to take them into places where they will be taking future strategic decisions or investment decisions because they say they only know that function yeah. they don't understand how the whole business works yeah. that yeah. so i i think it's it's important for people to move around a bit more it's a little scary at times because every time you change into a new area um, you scratch. don't know anything yeah okay. starting from scratch exactly 
I mean, you do know something because you were at the receiving end of it in, in other roles. But now suddenly you're answering for it. So yeah. you have to get in there and do it. Yeah. For me, what I also um, in this process learned is I think it was a self-discovering journey as well because you're constantly, to your point, uh, every three years you sort of hit a point where ah, I want to try something else now. But you also have a certain directional notional view of what it could be and you're seeking something which is like uh, an aspiration of what is the next big thing um for me it was like every new thing that i took up to your point mm -hmm. um in my profile can i just add something new i learned and as a result of which i did um, if i'm not able to do that and it's the same thing it's just that i've increased in um, my years of experience and then it wasn't really fulfilling enough for me. So I mm. went through this whole self-discovery journey and it has its success and failures. I mean, I've had failures, sometimes really bad ones as well, but you learn from them as well. I agree. Right? I agree. I think uh, um, my approach was a little less mature. Hmm. It's more like a kid in a candy shop looking around and saying, oh, what's the most fun thing going around now? And let's give it a try True. in this. Uh, I, I think it's also important, uh, I was talking to a bunch of students once, probably about eight, nine years ago, and I was telling them that, see, in, a, in an economy like ours, which is rapidly growing, there are, there are a large number of jobs that are getting created, which didn't exist 15 years ago, okay? Mm -hmm. Like we're sitting here with this podcast. I mean, this kind of stuff didn't exist yes. Yes. 15 years ago. So anyone who planned their career 15 years back would never have thought about doing this as a career. Okay, Maybe it's fun. Maybe it's paying. How do I know? So locking yourself into long-term career plans is probably not a great idea when you have a dynamic economy. Um, it worked in the 70s and 80s, but I don't think it will work now. One of the nuances um, of a squiggly career is also... Um, how it helps you build a holistic perspective. True. And you're constantly learning, unlearning, relearning, and then connecting the dots in a lot of ways, right? Has this been a similar experience for you? How have you gone through that? So I'll give you an example. Okay. Um, I was a, I had a very, uh, say, say, sketchy view of HR as a profession until I was suddenly told, can you also handle HR? And I'm like, are you sure you want me to do that? Uh, and they said, no, no, go ahead and do it. When I got into it, I, the whole department looked at me very warily because they said, this fellow doesn't know anything about HR. And I looked at them because they were all HR people. But over the next two, three years, we kind of got to both sides understood more of the other. Uh, they appreciated the fact that I could give them a better sense of what the business was looking for and what mattered and didn't matter. So they weren't going down a wrong path where they put in effort and time and then later find it's difficult. I appreciated the value of what they did um, and how much it mattered to people. Mm. Self-opinionated people like myself uh, tend to value our own opinions over others' opinions a lot. But that doesn't mean everybody's like that, right? So they, they want some more support and help uh, to try and figure out problems and, and what they should be doing, etc. So I realized that there was a lot more that that, that function could do in this. Uh, I think the, uh, like that, when you get into the nitty gritty of each role, you understand how much effort people are actually putting into it. Yeah. And if you come with a different perspective, why there may be an initial bit of resistance because, hey, this is not the way we do it over here. Afterwards, people say, okay, this, you know, if you're one of us and you're suggesting it, yeah, maybe we'll try it out. Yeah. Like this. And then when they start seeing results, then people say, yes, let's go ahead and do more. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a joint learning that happens. Uh, otherwise, it's an individual failure that you learn from and move on. Yeah. In this. Yeah. What I also, as a seller, um, this is my learning in my last stint as a seller, is 
when you as an organization are trying to go through a transformation mm-hmm. change is something which is very difficult mm-hmm. especially when it is across the organization yeah. and it does require every individual to come on board so this concept is quickly while it is a rare um, you know species like us who are out there the environment today demands that you have some bit of squiggliness in you in order to help the organization and yourself transform as well right yes uh, i think it's going to become less rare mm. as you go forward because there's going to be a need for this um i when i thought about this you know when you mentioned squiggly careers last week and i was mulling over it i said what changed and to me there are two things uh, one is wealth and the other is tech uh because as a nation we have ended up becoming more prosperous and um, when when i was a child uh, if you wanted to buy a car you booked it and waited 6 years uh, you wanted to have a phone you booked it and waited 4 years oh old i do i'm really old <laughs> okay so uh, it was a it was a very my children find it strange when mm-hmm. i said we were given cards saying how much milk you're allowed to buy okay you can't you need more milk you have to borrow it from a neighbor okay. so that is we had famines in this country in the 60s yeah. right so it was a it was a very different world but over time now we have become a 3 trillion dollar economy and uh, we have we have a lot of people making a, generating a lot of wealth Uh, and the overall middle class and we pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty when when they become cross that threshold they become customers mm. and then you start seeing diversity of needs once you meet, meet that basic need so suddenly your your whole economy starts getting things which it never had before like these podcasts yeah. i mean whoever had this in the past um so wa- wealth has created a diversity of need and therefore there are options for people to go around you know doing different things and doing a meaningful one uh, i was talking to my trainer uh, when i saw you know armies of people working out in the gym opposite the gym i was working in you know, across the road and he said all of them are becoming training as trainers ah. okay and i said all of them he said yes so i said how much will they make uh he said well between their jobs and their freelance work they probably make a lakh a month each i said wow i mean someone graduates from an engineering college in india they're lucky if they get 20000 bucks a month so you now you're saying that i can become a physical trainer and then make that much kind that kind of money it's it's a great it's great that the economy is able to sustain that yeah i, th- I also think there uh, it's also the uh, the access to the internet i think yes. um like if you're a sports person um you make a video put it out there there are you know your uh, clubs would actually get not- notice you and bring you on board if you are uh, like a podcaster go record something put it on spotify and you suddenly have an audience it's become much more easier absolutely for an individual to go through absolutely right? that's the tech and part the tech right, part right right you know, the tech and the cost of tech you know it's become so low yeah um people forget that when mobile phones were introduced it was 16 bucks a minute to make a call mm-hmm. right and now you you'd faint at the idea of paying anything like that we are one of the cheapest uh, countries in the world for internet connectivity and that tech has really you know leveled the playing field in many ways and increased opportunities Absolutely. i think it's been a huge churn that's yeah. happened in yeah. that yeah. and because of that creativity is needed as to how can i service the requirements that wealth has created with the stuff that tech is now offering me to do so people who need to be creative are not people who who play by the rules True. they're not the people who say i get into this then my next job is this then my next role is this then my next role is this they'll say what else can i do yeah yeah and i think that's where knowing different aspects of how things work is like a starting point to build your curiosity on ha huh, interesting Correct. but we can really change this in this way and i can make this happen or i have this capability 
and thereby you put your foot forward and interesting i want to slowly you know change the uh, gear towards the supply chain part mm -hmm. because uh, for me i felt your experience in that um is really required to do it tear down off um for a layman like me okay. um i started really getting exposed to supply chain i think when i took up this uh, product management slash program management role of managed print services in HP, where we were giving printers to large organizations and enterprises. And it covers the whole sales enablement, the service enablement, mm -hmm. and the supply chain part of it. And that's where I got exposed to supply chain is not as simple as uh, just the inventory aspect. It is uh, the vendors, the partners, the logistics, the pricing, and also the touch points with these interfaces like sales enablement and service enablement. Um, and that curiosity built, uh, you know, I was able to get into more details as I moved into GE Healthcare, where it's much more clear in terms of sales operations and how that works. And as a seller, it became even more obvious for me on what is happening there. But, and, and, and COVID really disrupted the space for India, especially. Most of us are used to more brick and mortar companies, barring your Amazons and the Flipkarts. And suddenly we were in need for supply chain to really relook at how it's done. And it became sexy suddenly. And again, it's back to mundane, wherein, you know, the focus is still on operational efficiency. But there's a lot more to it, like, you know, price reconciliation, satisfaction of each of these touch points, experience of each of these touch points, and of course, reducing productivity. Help me understand first from a layman's term, a very high level view, what aspects of supply chain come together to make it happen. So, um, you're, you're right about supply chain was not sexy earlier and became sexy. It's one of those professions where as long as things are working, nobody really cares about it. You know, it's like technology. It's like electricity. It, you only worry about it when, when power goes off. Then you say, oh my God, what's going on? These incapable people. And, you know, you take off on everyone around. So that's what happened. I think a lot of people even learned the term supply chain only when that ship got stuck in the Suez Canal yeah. and uh, everyone said, <laughs> oh, supply chains are disrupted, you know, in this. Uh, the concept of the supply chain is is age old. Hmm. Okay, In fact, uh, uh, essentially it is about how do I fulfill what I sell? Okay, How do I make sure that it's, it's over there? In fact, how do I even create something that I'm in a position to sell? Hmm. Uh, Originally, we were broken up functionally into people who did procurement, people who did manufacturing, people who did distribution. And um, many, many companies realized in the 80s and early 90s that this is not a very efficient way of doing something because the silos that we created over there ended up with a lot of waste. Okay. I would end up in stocking stuff which was not needed because I didn't know that uh, they're changing something in the sales plan because procurement is way back in the organization. Manufacturing is invested in putting in some equipment to manufacture stuff which is now not going to be required because procurements realize that, hey, we can get this cool new material which is available and you don't need that equipment anymore. So in the early 90s, they started stringing things together and saying, let's create one supply chain function. Uh, which looks at from end to end. It starts looking right back to where we get the sources of raw material and who all it goes through as intermediate producers, my own production, distribution to the point where the cons consumer can come and pick it up, mm. consumer or customer as it might be. Mm. Uh, it actually created a transformation in the um, ability to ensure that the product is available and the product's costs are controlled. So those are the two things that most supply chain professionals live and die by. Sure. Availability and cost. Sure. What COVID did is it threw uh, another element into the mix. It said risk. How do you handle risk? Okay, you can, you can 
over the year, decades, supply chains focused so much on these two, they became long in that every element we bring in someone who's a specialist in that. So I'm a specialist in, let's say, mining. I then supply the ore to someone who's a specialist in making aluminium. And then the aluminium person makes the product. It's die cast. It's brought in. It's machined. It's, so it goes through a string of people. I make sure each of them is a specialist. So it's a very good quality of work. And it's being done at the lowest cost because you distribute the cost across many different customers. When they had that long supply chain, uh, you could get dramatic products. Okay? You, you look at most of the Apple products, they're very high quality in terms of fit and finish and so on and so forth, but they have incredibly long supply chains uh, and complex supply chains to be able to create such a product. Mm. Not just Apple, any, any company today. Uh, the problem with long supply chains is like you're balancing something on your hand with another thing on top of it. Another, you know, you've seen those things where people dance with pots one on top of the other on their heads and then you're kind of wiggling your head to make sure you're balancing it. True. It's like that. True. Someone comes and pushes you and everything crashes And down. that push could be demand, the push could be some natural calamity somewhere, any of these. It right? could be that, you know, they have closed a border yeah. because you know, one state says, I don't want uh, people coming from another state in COVID time. Yeah. That's what actually happened. Yeah. Okay. So suddenly you realize that maintaining a long and highly efficient supply chain is very susceptible to failure. Mm. And people are rethinking, can we be a little bit more, the word they use is resilient. Uh, essentially, it says be a little safer, not extend ourselves to that, to that limit. Uh, so things are likely to end up costing a bit more. They may not be available as easily, uh, but the chances, instead of being 100% available all the time, they will be, let's say, 90% available or 95% available 90% of the time, because the 100% available all the time suddenly will become 0% available, you know, for about 20% of the time, which is can be a nightmare, you know, like the oxygen cylinder problem we yeah. faced, yeah. right, yeah. during the COVID uh, this thing. So, uh, it does require multiple skills to manage a supply chain. You need to be able to uh, obviously have uh, a lot of engineering because there are things that move and things that load and things that have to carry and so on and so forth, make. Then you have to have people who can negotiate and contract because you, you want to make sure that all the people in the supply chain, all the different players are getting a worthwhile return for the effort that they put in over there. Uh, then you have to have someone who can plan and orchestrate it so that they can they can figure out and anticipate demand and then inform people up and down the supply chain what is it that needs to be done. And once you've got those in, it's dynamic, so it keeps things keep changing. It's complicated when you also introduce innovation. Mm. Okay. Everybody wants innovation. So you've set up a supply chain to do something and suddenly the product has changed. So you have to change all the pieces in the supply chain, whoever's making or shipping, et cetera, et cetera, in order to make sure they can service the new new product. So that's where the complexity actually comes into this. It makes for a very interesting problem. Okay, uh, It also is a powerful capability and it's become more so in recent years. Uh, to give an analogy, when, when we were younger, a movie would appear in theaters and run for, you know, two months, three months, six months, even a year. Uh, and there'd be celebrations, you know, that the same movie's been running for one year in this theater. Now, the last two weeks, we're lucky. Yeah. That's the same thing with product life cycles. Okay. Uh, earlier, you you bought a car and you, you, you drove the car for 10 years. Uh, now, you probably change it every two, three years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you'd probably change your mobile phone every two years or even one year, depending upon your fancy. Uh, so they're constantly bringing new stuff. Bringing new stuff becomes challenging, you know, uh, because everybody up and down the supply chain has to change. And you still want it at the same price. Uh, and you still want it available in the store whenever you go in the color you want. So it's not easy to do that and get things going. And that's why supply chains overextended themselves. 
So one of the curious things I've got in this is also irrespective of where you are within an organization, you no longer have the luxury of saying, oh, I don't understand supply chain. Yes. Um, if you're a developer, you need to understand this journey to be able to innovate in your space. If you're a seller, you need to understand this to understand what needs to be positioned where. If you're a data person, you need to know what kind of relevant data is required to make this the most optimal and profitable way of doing it. Um, so it's no longer something that you can sort of just say, ah, I don't understand supply chain. It becomes um, sort of a necessity in a lot of ways. Um, and it also then becomes an onus on all leaders, managers, as well as individuals to really understand this, even if it is at a 6,000 feet or 60,000 feet. Well, many of them get uh, far more involved in that. Mm. Uh, you know, once we started this whole re-engineering business, uh, process re-engineering and all that in companies, essentially to eliminate waste. Mm. Uh, one of the simple guidelines people would give is either you're making something or selling something. If you're not doing either of those, what are you doing over here? Okay. Then they modified it a bit to saying either you're making something or you're helping someone make something or you're selling something or you're helping someone sell something. Mm. Uh, that's where things like data scientists and all that who, who never could make or sell anything would, would kind of fit in. Uh, so when you start doing that, you have to be actively involved in it. And most salespeople are also very, very concerned with supply chain and keep close tabs on it because the last thing you want to do is to go and persuade someone to buy something and, and then say, um, I'm sorry, I can't give it to you. You know, it's, uh, it's not available. Maybe next month kind of a thing. So salespeople are usually very sensitive to that. And uh, you're right, more and more people have realized that at the heart of it, you're either supposed to be making something or you're selling something. So supply chain has become very visible mm. to all different functions over there. And one classic thing I have noticed is there are companies like Asian Paints or Page Industries um, who've sort of figured this out and especially Asian Paints have has innovated as a result of this as well, whether it is with their technology, how they handle distribution, how they understand their customer pulse and thereby, you know, even the inventory and the cash flow management of it. Is it very hard for a lot of Indian companies to adopt this or where's the challenge for? So, um, APINS has historically been uh, extremely good with operations and technology usage. In fact, we used to use it as a benchmark even in the 90s. Okay? Yeah. Um, but you, you have to look at the context for Indian companies. Mm. For all the way till the 90s, uh, you had restrictions on what you can make, how much you can make. Mm. Okay? Uh, if you made more than you had a license for, you were in trouble with the government. Mm. Okay? So... Uh, it's a, it was a strange world. It was a world of central planning. Mm. Okay. I think clearly it's been shown through various historical experiments in nations. Central planning doesn't work very well for an economy. Um, and uh, what works much better is a, uh, a more free market economy where you can choose to take risk and manufacture what you want and sell it. And then if it works, fine. If it doesn't work, creative destruction, as they say. It goes. So Indian companies uh, worked, grew up in an environment of whatever they made, sold. Mm. Uh, post the 90s, the last, uh, the first 10 years after liberalization, we were still in a state of shell shock. We didn't realize what was going on. All we knew is that customs duties were coming down and more, there was a threat of more foreign goods coming in. But I think from about the last 20 years, uh, Indian companies have been become much better at figuring this out. Um, and uh, you've, you'll see that uh, there's been a steady improvement, not just in their ability to market, but also package, distribute, uh, scale, all of which is dependent on a supply chain that works. Mm -hmm. okay. Are they perfect? Not a hope. 
I mean, I've done so many consulting projects in the last 10 years. Uh, upside, uh, and we would do work which is essentially outcome-based. So we say, depending upon how much improvement we bring to your PNL or balance sheet, we charge you a fraction of that. Mm. So that way the client doesn't get pay, you know, high consulting fees and not get anything at the end of the day. They only pay for what they get. And in that model, we would very easily find, you know, 25%, 30%, 50% improvements possible in their supply chain. The reason for that is usually two factors. One, there was a lack of knowledge. Okay, because we didn't have a, a historical base of expertise in this field. We never needed it in the past. So senior management was not exposed to these concepts when they were young mm -hmm. and on, you know, doing their procurement and shop floor work, etc. So it needed to come from outside. Uh, the second, uh, uh, one part was that. The second part was the uh, lack of investments that we would make mm -hmm. in automation and equipment that was needed. So talent and investment were two big areas. If you go see a warehouse in India, and you go see a warehouse outside India, the stock differences yeah. are there, right? Um, and I would have to explain that to international, you know, uh, if we had any senior managers coming from uh, parent companies to India for our clients, and we say, you know, these people, this is your carrying and forwarding agents, uh, CFAs who you have who are distributing the product. They'll say, what's that? So I'll describe it and they'll say, oh, you mean like a third-party warehouse? Mm. I'll say, yes, but, but I know what you have in your mind. You're thinking this big, huge industrial shed and these forklifts going in and out and racks and things going up and putting it here, taking it down, etc. I said, oh, that's not how it'll be here. Here there'll be, you know, it'll be a small little place. There'll be people carrying stuff in, stacking it all over the place. And so then I'll organize for them to go and see it. And they'll come back saying, whoa, so how do you guys manage it? You know? So uh, I think we've not invested enough. That's changing. There's but a lot is of that also because labor is much more cheaper for us here? It used to be, but now it's becoming very hard to find labor uh, for most of these activities. Hmm. And that's because this is no longer an aspirational role. Nobody wants to spend their life lifting boxes out of a truck and carrying it into a warehouse and putting it back. So automation is going to be required not because um, not because uh, we want to displace labor. Automation is going to be required because you don't have labor now. People don't want to work in these kind of areas. So if you, uh, NSDC had done an interesting study, which I, I saw some years back, uh, when we were looking at what are the kind of job skill gaps that there were district by district, so that when we, we were doing some work on um, generating jobs, so we wanted to know what to help people train in. They had studied this by district and said, this is the skill gaps that are there, but they had also plotted against that, which are the aspirational areas. Mm. Most of the cases where the skill gap was there, plumbers, carpenters, etc., the youngsters didn't have any interest in that. They wanted to work in retail. They wanted to work in, you know, stores and uh, this. They didn't want to work with mechanics, for example. So you had a disconnect between those. So they're not going to come for those jobs. Uh, labor is a was a problem in COVID, but it's actually been a problem for 10 years before this. In this. So automation has been on the agenda. Um, because our supply chains were always so focused on cost in India, uh, because a lot of people still cannot afford to pay a premium for products. Mm. Um, so we have to keep costs very low. So you would avoid investments. Mm. But that balance is shifting, where now it's cheaper to invest capital and not depend on uncertain labor. It's over there. Got it. So it'll change. <clears throat> and one of the things I noticed, again, selling through COVID was... Um, the shift from the brick and mortar 
to the e-commerce, although it is still 1% to 5%. And we know some of the larger giants like the Reliance and the uh, Flipkarts and the Amazons. The rest of Indian organizations are slowly shifting to that. So would optimization then be a focus still for a long time with most of these? And the whole concept of digital is coming in, which is like, you know, now that things are opening up, there's e-commerce and there's um, on store in-store experience and then there's this connected experience of, uh, they call it the digital world. How does supply chain sort of transform in this? Is it just around optimization or are we then talking a bigger um, view of it in terms of customers, in terms of how we engage with vendors and uh, farm to plate journey uh, really gets transformed itself. So uh, it's it's way more complex than that. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because uh, in India, the complexity is more on the customer side than on your vendor and the supply side. So the supply chain trying to deliver to the customer is far more complex. Um, if you look at it very often, um, first, there's a lot of visibility of e-commerce especially in the uh, COVID times. Mm. But you must remember that was largely an urban phenomenon. Mm. It was simply not there for 70% of the population. Okay? Because uh, most, of these, uh, most of these people are operating in probably the top 80 or 100 cities in, this, in the country, if that. Uh, again, in overall terms, $3 trillion GDP, 60% household consumption. So you're talking about, say, $1.8 trillion dollars. Uh, our e-commerce firms all added up. Uh, even if you club B2C and B2B are just a small fraction of that. Mm. It's probably 50 to $80 billion. Mm. So it's, a, it's really still a drop in the bucket. Mm. For most large firms, if you look at e-commerce is probably 2 to 5% of their sales. True. Okay. So where does the rest of it go? The rest of it, the big chunk of it goes through uh, what's called general trade okay so these are all your different kirana stores little outlets it doesn't matter whether you're selling fast moving consumer good products or you're selling uh, consumer durables or you're selling plastic goods or whatever it might be uh, you have a zillion small outlets which are servicing the market mm -hmm. over there uh, then that is in the relatively organized accessible uh, trade then you have the rural trade, which is really hard to service because uh, some years ago I was in, we were doing, a, we, we had to keep visiting different parts of the country to understand customers and what they're doing. I was in a small village about 80 kilometers, 90 kilometers out of Bhopal mm -hmm. and uh, there were two shops in the village. Okay, And that's it. That's about eight, 10, 15 houses, uh, two shops and it He'll keep a few things there. How much sale will they have? And the shop contains all sorts of stuff. Each of those companies has to deliver there. How do you deliver there and even pay for the cost of fuel to come to that place? Leave alone anything else. Mm. It's not possible. So what happens is you have a big wholesale market. Okay, so then companies sell into wholesale. The wholesale traders do things like, you know, set up markets, uh, temporary markets. And... Uh, shop owners come to markets, pick it up and go. So it's a very complex chain to make sure that uh, pro produce is reaching uh, customers all across the country. Uh, on the one hand, you have that. The other hand, you're dealing with, let's say, these chains. Okay, So uh, they will say, I have central buying, supply to my warehouse. Uh, you go there for a meeting, you're, they will sit and give you PowerPoint presentations from their BI system saying what was your fill rate, what was this, what was that. And on the other hand, you're also dealing with somebody who says, you know, when I get in the bus and this, this, uh, I need to pick up this packet and bring it. So we have a very, very diverse kind of portfolio, which your supply chain has to service. Mm -hmm. So what you typically do is you segment the supply chain. You send one part of it is going to service the customer who is the organized modern retail trade um, or maybe industrials. Uh, you'll have another which is going to larger retailers 
then you'll have something which is going towards distributors and dealers and then there will even be separate channels which are going into re rural mm -hmm. so reaching the indian consumer or customer is actually quite tough that's where the complexity comes manufacturing is getting more and more consolidated okay especially after gst has happened um, before gst we had to artificially break up manufacturing and uh, distribution because they were each state had its own taxes so it was guaranteed you had to have warehouses multiple warehouses in every state now you can be focus on efficiency better and uh, and reduce travel time so it, it's helped a lot operationally in this uh, and also in terms of uh, getting from your suppliers you know you know concepts like strategic sourcing and all which have been around for a long while allow for a more streamlined sourcing mm. so the supply and manufacture has become easier mm. it's becoming more consolidated uh, distribution is still a huge challenge and i think it will continue to be for a long long time in our country the um in this when you're trying to say uh, how do i deal with all those things uh, what we typically do is you end up having sales and supply chain getting segmented by customer mm. on the distribution side and then you will have a separate organization which is looking at the manufacture produce and reaching it to the the point of where it gets distributed and many international companies are also organized like this globally taking a quick break from our conversation today I wanted to quickly talk about our collaboration partner Hubhopper. This podcast was created on Hubhopper Studio. If you wish to start your own podcast for free, please visit www.hubhopperstudio.com. Hubhopper is India's leading podcast creation platform. Start your podcast with Hubhopper Studio and get your voice heard um, across platforms like Spotify, Ghana, Google Podcasts, Wink Music, and many more. Click on the link in the episode description to or visit hubhopperstudio.com. Thank you, Hubhopper, for the collaboration. And now we go back to our conversation. One of the things I also discovered uh, <clears throat> during my sales journey is the transformation that's happening in plantations and warehouses. Um, I recently also had a guest uh, who was into real estate and he mm -hmm. was talking about how um, he's focused on the startups of India and thereby, you know, he wants to be the end-to-end -end solution provider from a real estate point of view for startups. And warehouses are a big part of that. So there seems to be a lot happening in this space. And yet we're talking about distribution being a challenge. What could completely break that and really make it seem less? Investment. A lot of investment. So when you, when you, hear, the, the government, uh, when you hear the government talking about you know, huge infrastructure investments, um, it's not just roads. Okay? You also need you know, uh, industrial parks, you need warehousing parks mm. to be created where you can create an infrastructure where, let's say, uh, today if you see a truck, okay, you have a general purpose 10 ton truck, which very often lands up. And then if people are swarming over it, taking off tarpaulins and carrying the boxes out, etc., etc., then lifting it up and taking it into some place and, and stacking it over there. Uh, even 20 years ago, if you go, uh, let's say, to the Middle East, that job would have been done by one or two people. Mm. Okay? Because firstly, uh, the truck would not have a top wall and it will be closed. Second, you would have uh, all the goods on pallets. You just take a forklift, go pick up the whole pallet, take it in and put it, slot it straight into the place where it's to be. Uh, so the result is you ended up turning around that truck and that truck becomes productive in, say, half an hour. It's not uncommon to see 20, 30 trucks waiting to unload stuff in Indian warehouses. They're parked in the roads, they're parked outside waiting to come. And they're idle for days until they can uh, unload their goods. Now, you can say the trucker will get paid for it, but that's fine. That's a cash transaction between the company that hired him and the truck. It's an economic waste of that resource. Okay, So turn that truck around and get it out 
to, to move stuff. That's what a truck is supposed to do. Um, so, like that, we need a lot of investment. Is that a good example of sunk cost? Sorry? Is that a good example of sunk cost as well? I don't know. Uh, see, my focus is on productivity mm. rather than on sunk cost. Mm. It doesn't matter to me how much that truck cost. Mm. What matters to me is whether the truck can generate value or not. True. And it, trucks generate value by moving stuff. True. So if and it's how sitting, much you move. Yeah, if it's sitting still, it's not moving stuff. You know? It's why airlines, they look at making sure they turn around as quickly as possible because airlines generate value only when they're flying. Mm. So you have to get them off the ground fast. You know? So it's, it, it's like that. You, you have to invest a lot more so that uh, and it's not as if it's all expense we pay a lot in damages we pay a lot in terms of delays we pay a lot there's a lot of hidden cost and who pays for that cost it's the end customer because yeah. ultimately the customer pays for it okay so by making that investment we can actually end up in either creating a surplus which can be shared between lower prices for the customer and more profits for the company that is making it. So what will change? I think it is primarily, one is big investment. The second is, I think we need a lot more talent into this field. This is a, this is a field which is now getting, the more and more institutions are generating people who have a uh, background in operations and in supply chain and, and design and, and operations of supply chains. And that's very important because if you go back 10, 15 years, there were not that many people. There were hardly one or two colleges which produced people. Now you've got, it's become very popular. Mm. Okay. And that's good because it's, a, it's an extremely important profession. One of the, so, so far, I think I've been, through your conversation, I've been sort of in my mind thinking of products which are, non-perishable like your phones and right. things like that but the agriculture supply chain um, is a different ball game itself right you're dealing with perishables there's a time limit to most of them at least on how long it can you know it needs to be on shelf and how quickly it can reach the end customer there's a transformation happening there and I think there's a lot actually playing in for our country, whether it is, like you said, the GSD, um, the UPI, um, the mobile access through geo and, you know, and then, of course, the government's focus on education, financial inclusion and agriculture itself. Walk me through what's happening in the agri. The, you introduced me to the world of, you know, the agri entrepreneur as well as the agri known and the agri idea talk to me about the agri supply chain what's hmm. happening there what's disruption there so um, everybody says india liberalized in the 1991 you know when um, uh, Man prime minister manmohan singh pushed through the first set of this thing uh, actually nothing happened in agriculture hmm. so we we have a, a very archaic system mm. in agriculture as per the law, if you look at it. Um, the farmer in that way has had a very funny situation. You are a working professional. You can choose to work for any company you want in any city in the country you want. You can go out of the country if you want. Right? Uh, someone makes um, equipment. They can sell to anybody they want. But a farmer can uh, technically only sell to the local Monday. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, the, the prices are fixed there. The, who they sell to is fixed there. Everything is done. So it's a, it's a, it was a system set up about 60 years ago because at that time we lacked the, the kind of uh, s channels for people to sell. In front, so. And uh, it was a good system at that point in time. It started off, it gave them a footing to go ahead and you know, produce and sell. And then we brought in all these other green revolution and so on and so forth, which looked at the inputs to the farm. But uh, those were days when India still suffered from famines. We had famines in the 40s, the 50s and the 60s. And we were reliant on grain coming into the country from outside. Mm. 
our mindset is still stuck over there. Uh, we today produce an excess of grain. Okay, we. Uh, I, I remember when I was in Britannia, ten years ago, we used to monitor wheat surpluses in stocks because wheat was a big input. And um, not only has the wheat production gone up from those days, it was like seventy million tons. I think it's about a hundred million tons now. Those days we used to keep uh, nationally, uh, we'd have a buffer stock, the country would have a buffer stock of about 20, 24 million tons. Today we have 70 million tons. Mm -hmm. We don't have the capacity to store 70 million. So we are holding almost a year's stock that way. So it's all stored badly, it spoils, etc. The flip side is if you see the nutrition studies, there was a recent one that was launched by, I forget who it was, was one of the UN uh, agencies which showed that we have declined in nutrition terms in the last 10 years. Mm. And that is because our focus is on food grain. Mm. Uh, I don't think anybody who's listening to this podcast will say that they, a healthy meal consists of just rice or just wheat. Okay, They will say, reduce the carbs, you know, go and eat more fresh vegetables, eat more protein. Eat the, but those are not things we are encouraging in our current systems. So those are changes that are happening. The, the consumer has changed. The agricultural system is still sitting in the 60s. Okay. Uh, that is undergoing change now. Now, firstly, what's happened, not just now, last some time, what's happened is more and more uh, farmers have moved away from looking only at what the government is suggesting that they do. Mm -hmm. So they have, but the, 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 the framework for that is not yet, fully put in place. So about a year and a half or so ago, uh, there was this framework called the Open Digital Ecosystem, yeah. ODE, that was drawn up, saying how can we use this power of the internet, which has helped to transform life for many people in urban centers, to transform the supply chain. It's called the post-harvest. So mm -hmm. after the farmer has harvested, uh, and it was targeted at small holding farmers. Mm -hmm. okay. So the post-harvest small holding farmer supply chain, that is. Uh, it's pretty big. 80% uh, of farmers in this country are small to micro holding farmers. That is, they have less than two hectares of land. Uh, they till about a third of all the arable land in this country. So it's a very large chunk. About a third of it. Yes, oh. of, of this thing is by small marginal farmers. Now, uh, the average farm household in a study by Nabard on uh, All India Financial Inclusion Study hmm. says they are indebted. The average debt is about a lakh, lakh and three thousand or something. Their monthly surplus is under 1,500 rupees. Okay. So they can't even service very often, many cases, they can't service the interest cost of the debt that they are carrying with this. So, Getting more money to the farmer is very important. Okay? Those are our people and we need to make sure that they lead better lives. Is it possible? Oh, absolutely. You look at farm gate price and you look at consumer retail price, it is a huge difference. True. Okay? Uh, the, you were talking a little earlier about coconuts and you said like 5 to 6 rupees at farm and it's like 30 rupees over here. That's a huge difference. So where does that money go? Why, how can we get more of it to the farmer? So uh, there were several areas of change that were needed in the rural supply chain. The first was very simple, market access. Hmm. How can I sell to somebody? Okay. Uh, how do I know when we want to sell something, I'll go and say, how much are you willing to pay? How much are you willing to pay? How much are you willing to pay? And I'll go to the person who will pay me the most. To be able to do that, I have to be able to find buyers. Hmm. So that is market access. Uh, a second big thing is credit. Uh, when a farmer has crops, maybe two crops, three crops in a year, cash comes in two, three times in a year. Mm. Expenses are all through the year. So I need credit in that uh, intermediate period. It will be credit against my collateral of produce that I have, uh, but someone has to give me the credit. Uh, another is storing and transportation of goods. Okay. So we need... Um, if your fruit is transported, dumped in a trailer, by the time it gets to the market, it's already crushed. When we go into a shop, we expect the fruit to be 
looking fresh and neat, neat packaging, etc., etc. Someone's got to do all that. So you have to have the right way in which to take it to a place. It's got to be cleaned, sorted, put into packaging, etc. All those are activities that happen by what people call middlemen mm. between farm gate and the retail store. There's a lot of steps in between that need to be accomplished. The more we can streamline those steps, the way industrial supply chains streamlined over the years and became so much more efficient, um, today, you know, if you look at a, a flight ticket from Bangalore to Delhi, it probably costs the same that it cost 10, 15 years ago. Hmm. Okay. If you're buying a car, it probably costs the same as what it cost 10, 15 years ago. It's not that there was no inflation, but at the same time, there was a steady cost reduction by waste elimination happening and innovation happening. We need to do the same thing for farm supply chains. We have to look at market access. We have to look at increasing credit to them. We have to give them better storage, transportation, and um, uh, logistic services. Uh, think of it like an Uber for farmers. Mm. And we have to be able to provide equipment on hire. Okay, so I don't. I have a small holding. I can't afford to buy a harvester and a tractor and something else, everything that is needed. So I rent it out for when it's required. All of this is happening, but it's happening in kind of local pockets, pockets rather than having a um, having a platform where everyone bids and I can then do make sure that the prices don't go unduly high in one locality versus another because that kind of levels the price for everybody. So that will help to bring in some efficiencies. So you're absolutely right. We need and there are a lot of work that's going on in this space where they're bringing in a combination of physical infrastructure as well as digital infrastructure to help manage and improve the supply chain that's operating over there. There's a lot of startup work going on in this area. Yeah. And um, a lot of VCs which are focused on ag tech, as they call it. Um, there is also a lot of capital investment going into this area. So I think it's a very... Uh, the next 10 years is going to be a very exciting time in the agricultural space. And it will probably help, uh, I'm sure it will help, uh, a lot of the population to substantially increase their incomes. In this thing. So what you're also envisioning is like the 90s were transformative for us <clears throat> from an industrial perspective, the current... 20, uh, what I've heard is like for, for the last four years, there's been transformation happening in the yes. agriculture space. There's a lot of entrepreneurship and funds coming in, especially outside funds um, on the agri-entrepreneur, whether it is on providing the right data to our farmers, so the information on what crop what's the soil quality, what's the weather, et cetera, or access to the technology, whether it is the machines um, and the other aspects, or storage. Storage is a huge problem. Huge problem. And yes. so innovation around that, even around price rationalization, like you mentioned, um, plus the uh, entrepreneurship among our farmers. There's a that's lot true. of training and work that's happening in inclusivity there in terms of how women are coming on board into that as well. So you do see this as a major transformation for I our think, country. Yes. I think it's going to be huge in this area. The the um, the, the challenge that they're, they're um, facing, I think probably the biggest risk is how do you make sure the government doesn't get too involved in this? Hmm. Okay. It's going to ask you that. <laughs> if you look at uh, if you look at our country, uh, one industry which has done brilliantly is the tech industry. Yeah. Right. It's it's transformed not just tech in the country, but even our entire Lifestyle. global position, right. yeah. uh, everything. The technology industry is dramatic. Yeah. Go back to the early nineties. Uh, you could not, if you're a software company, you could not get a loan from a bank. Why? Because banks operated with what was called Chore Commission uh, guidelines, which said, against these assets, you can lend. Mm. Software, nobody understood. So the software industry willy-nilly had to become internationally competitive 
it had to bootstrap itself and got VC funding and went ahead. Okay? So it became a truly competitive industry. If you want competitiveness and you want better realizations, the government should enable and step out of the way. Because where the, they get involved, they get pressured by pressure groups to take suboptimal decisions in this. And governments, like large organizations of all kinds, are lousy at innovation. So let the innovation happen with startups. Let them take the big risks and create something. Let other people build on it and take it forward. What, what the government needs to do is to make sure that uh, you know, your policies are open enough, uh, safeguard things, help with you know regulation and stuff like that. Not necessarily come and say, how should you grow wheat or how should you grow tomatoes or cauliflower. Uh, I mean, there are enough people who can give those inputs now. It's we are not in the 60s anymore, okay, where we needed nobody knew anything. Uh, they should not be worried too much about. Uh, setting up infrastructure themselves, they should be looking at getting private people to set up the infrastructure. Okay? Because infrastructure is only usable as long as it is maintained. Hmm. Governments are not very good at maintaining stuff in that sense. So it doesn't make sense for them to do it, um, in, get too involved in it, but they must create a, an environment which allows people to go ahead and, and do stuff. Hmm. It will automatically happen then. That's what I believe. What I'm also seeing, and maybe uh, this is more validation of the assumption, is there is a lot of startups coming up in this space. There is external investment coming in to make these startups successful. But there's also an opportunity for our, our own industries, whether it is uh, companies that are manufacturing automobiles, companies that are uh, banks that are uh, providing loans, um, education institutions um, to really innovate, to really cater to this market and the demand that's happening here. So do you see disruptions happening in from other verticals towards the agriculture sector as well? I suspect the in disruption will happen by startups in those verticals. Interesting. Okay. Uh, globally, we have seen large companies are really bad at innovating. Okay, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Most most of the large tech companies innovate by acquisition uh, because they realize that, hey, you know what, after you reach a certain size, you're not going to innovate. Yeah, so you acquire companies. Um, same way, the, the startup will innovate because the startup doesn't sit and have a huge history and internal power plays to worry about, etc., etc. So all the areas you talked about, education, financing, infra, market access, you can have in this. Uh, there are exceptions to that. Hmm. So in, I think around 2014 or 15, the first digital market was set up in Karnataka. It was the Rashtriya e-market service hmm, that they set up. This, yeah. And uh, it was essentially saying uh, the transactions which happen at Mondays would happen digitally the broker would uh, get a, a, a bid from someone, would get it approved digitally through phone by the farmer and then uh, would close the deal if the farmer agrees to it. Okay. Uh, I think some two, three years after that, there were some independent studies, some academics had done to evaluate whether statistically they could show that the farmers actually got an improvement in price realization as a result of this over the old system. Uh, it's, a, it's a little tricky because uh, whatever you are measuring um, is also dynamic. You don't know whether the price went up because prices just went up or whether it was because of this. So they, they had to isolate all those factors, which they did. And then they came back and said, yes, it has actually really helped benefit this thing. So that was a case where the government did an innovation. And the next year, the union government created, took that same thing and created the model called E-National agricultural market, ENAM. Mm. So we have two markets now in the country, ENAM and REMS. Mm. Uh, that was an innovation that was done. But I think now what's happened, that was about six, seven years ago. But now you've got a lot more direct startup innovators happening. It'll happen much faster. There'll be swarms of them trying to do different things. 
um, much better to for the for the agricultural economy uh, rather than one government project happening at that point. So I think it's better to leave the innovation to the smaller smaller companies, and many large companies have also established mechanisms to tap into this. Hmm. So uh, I uh, one comp one such company was uh, AB InBev. Um, they told uh, I was talking to one of them. They have a concept that once in a quarter they would have supply chain heads from different regions of the world hmm. meet up in in some location and spend a couple of days um, meeting startups. Okay, just to understand what they're doing, and if something looks promising. Go ahead and do a pilot with them. Very sensible method. Because for a large company to do an innovation itself is tough. To do 100 of them, I mean, it sounds nice to say, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, but you know how it is in a large organization. It's not going to happen. You've got too many approvals, too many agendas, etc., etc. So you just invite them, see what they're doing, and then go ahead and do it. I think the same same approach, which I, governments have caught on to. So every government is now supporting startups, encouraging them with grants, etc. That's the right way to do it. So here, one thought that comes in is, I always feel this is the time to be an entrepreneur in India. This is a perfect time because there's so much transformation that's happening. So for someone who's looking at and there's a lot of churn that's happening in organizations, especially after COVID with, uh, I think there was an article, I don't know if it is 40% uh, of the workforce is thinking of, you know, moving out of oh, your the great jobs, resignation, the yeah. great resignation journey, right? And so this sort of seems to be coming together in some way. So if I am one of the listeners here really thinking about what am I doing? What's purpose in life? It seems to be a very purposeful journey to go on to transform the nation and really to think of some startup. What is some advice to folks who are thinking of starting something in the agri space on how to go about? So I'll, I'll answer it in two steps. One agri and the other is in uh, supply chain. Mm. Okay, Because agri can include also non-supply chain mm. you know, stuff. First, uh, like any startup, uh, it requires a period of searching to identify a gap that's there in the market which needs to get filled. Second, uh, it is going to almost certainly the first one, two, three areas you look at will not work out. Okay, and But you learn more in the process. Uh, it will be a great, fun journey. Uh, and I think today's uh, environment supports it hugely compared to the early 90s when I first started. And um, uh, you, if you have a good idea, there are many mechanisms which are willing to help you go ahead and try something out. Okay. So when I said first one, two, three things may not work, I don't think you'll have a problem in getting it funded to mm. go and do that. I think the problem will be your own personal resilience hmm. to say, this is a learning experience. It's not a failure. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the day you say it's a failure, then you're going to say, I, I think I'll just go and get a job. In this. So it has to be people who can ride such you know, emotional roller coasters in a sense and still come through. And there are all kinds to do that. Uh, the field is wide open. There are a lot of uh, supply chain um, startups that are that are in place. They're growing remarkably well. They have very high valuations. Um, there are also a lot of ag tech, um, and the environment for ag tech has become far more sophisticated. So you're you'll get much more support. Mm. There are more of these hackathons and this and. Um, VCs who are willing to sit and talk to you, angel investors who are willing to sit and talk. And, uh, but the, for a, I suspect for many of the listeners on this podcast, ag is a different world. Hmm. Okay, so you should spend more time traveling around in India and seeing, not, not to tourist places, but going and seeing what is actually happening in the markets, what is actually happening in farms, what is actually happening when 
farmers go and get their produce out, difficulties they face, what happens in distribution, how companies are. So it's a very, very different world from the urban world that uh, many people may be living in mm. at this point. So it's worth immersing yourself in that for some time. Um, otherwise, you're likely to come up with what you think are areas of important work, but nobody really seems to care about it. And that can be very disheartening. Uh, it takes time to go and understand where the problems really are and what people want solved first. True, true. Well, uh, one of the other questions I had around this is with the COP26 conversations that are happening, uh, sustainability is a focus for every country, uh, rightfully for us as well. Do you see that also playing a big role in supply chain itself? A huge role. Um, so a lot of people, when they talk about innovation in supply chain, the first word I hear is blockchain. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, blockchain is fine for contract and traceability and all that. But I think this really significant innovations uh, that are going to happen in supply chain is uh, one is uh, what we're calling the um, mm, green supply chain mm. uh, where you're trying to reduce the carbon footprint. Mm. Uh, when I earlier described that supply chains have become very long, uh, it has a huge problem. That means you're moving items over great distances. Okay. Uh, and uh, sometimes is that the true cost of that is externalized. Uh, so you don't end up bearing it mm. in that sense. Uh, many companies have now started seriously taking a look at that. So where they focused entirely on availability and cost, uh, they are now saying also add, um, what's my carbon footprint? It's hard. Because it's not easy to measure and there are no standard. I mean, accounting has been around for thousands of years. Okay, uh, Availability, easy to measure. It's also been a, a established quite well. But how do I start measuring what's my carbon footprint? And is it reducing? Is it not reducing? Uh, am I? How do I include the carbon footprint of my vendors? It's not just okay for me to do it, but I say... Oh, I don't want to import it from 1,000 kilometers away, so let's ask Akash to import it 1,000 kilometers, and he gives it to me in 5 kilometers. And I say, I've saved my carbon footprint. I haven't. It's still coming from 1,000 kilometers away. So that's an, one big innovation that's happening. The second one that people are working on, which will have a huge impact, is called the circular supply chain. Hmm. Uh, the circular supply chain is about, okay, I make this, uh, let's say, pack, pack of chocolates, uh, I sell it, okay. Uh, you buy it, you take it, then you chuck away the packaging. What happens to the packaging? Okay. Uh, it goes very often into, it used to go into landfill. Now it goes to recycling. BOPP is really tough to recycle. Okay, the cardboard box part may be okay. But thinking through all this in advance and designing it into the product and establishing a mechanism to make sure that the um, waste that comes after use of the product is addressed. Uh, it's called extended uh, producer responsibility. And it's an important part, uh, which is increasingly becoming regulatory. Mm. If you recall, one area that it's already well established is in things like automotive batteries. True. When you change the battery in your car or your two-wheeler, uh, the old battery is taken back by the car. True. They, they need to do that because otherwise lead is a very poisonous substance. Um, Many of the other packaging material we use is no less poisonous. In fact, your electronics stuff is highly poisonous. Mm -hmm. The more of that that goes into landfills, the worse it is for the environment. So this whole circular supply chain looks at how to get it back. Not only get it back, but how can I recycle mm -hmm. and reuse? You have finite resources. You can't keep mining fresh produce and then using it and then chucking it away. You have to figure out how to recycle that stuff and reuse the waste back into high quality produce. Mm. So those are, I think, are probably bigger areas of innovation than what usually gets the headlines in this. And one of the learnings I've had is 
inclusion is no longer something like a luxury it sort of is a necessity for each one of us and as organizations as individuals as managers as leaders it is even more important to really understand the nuances and then be inclusive and inclusivity is not just about people uh, within your organization it's also about you know the larger ecosystem Absolutely. the customer base is your larger ecosystem as well well it goes beyond the customer base right. so you know the ruckus that's been going on outside bangalore in the villages where all the waste that was generated in bangalore was going and getting dumped mm. then villagers started protesting mm. rightly so they said why should we have to deal with the poisoning of our environment because you are creating the waste so they would stop uh, you know trucks from bringing the waste over there and i think that was entirely correct on their part uh putting in place mechanisms to treat sewage to treat waste etc is part of the extended producer responsibility if you are if you're going to generate a product which is very hard to thereafter dispose of safely you own the responsibility for the mess it creates you can't just say i don't know you know and I, you can't just say i only worry about my customers mm. okay if your produce is poisoning kids who are as a result of you know your customers chucking something away you have to worry about that you can't say it's not my problem over there that's like saying i make guns but don't ask me what people do with guns yeah. okay which yeah. is the famous argument that's going on in the us yeah. so you in a way you're all creating you know weapons of uh, destruction and you're circulating it over there so you're absolutely right when thinking this through it needs to be inclusive it has to be looking at all kinds of societies mm. and all different aspects of you know uh, the journey you know. itself well society is one thing your environment is another your wildlife is another if you want to preserve what it is and not have a dystopian wasteland in the future which i don't think we'll get to because i think people are already aware of this and yeah. i think the particularly the younger generation i'm seeing they think a lot more about this yeah. rightly so okay uh, and so the kind of innovations and the ideas that are going to come up uh we're going to look at them and say oh ho oh, that's a good one it's a, it's actually a very useful kind of thing and it will then get built in to the way we we manufacture and distribute produce and how much of data transformation are you seeing in this because supply chain is a connected world it's connected to your sales enablement which is your customer behavior your leads and all of that to your fno and also to your service aspect of it and logistics and it's sort of like the um i don't know what's the part body part equivalent for supply chain which sort of holds it it's like a the, central nervous system that way right mm. so data sort of and connected data thereby becomes very useful to make the right decisions at the right time absolutely for both optimization and also for the next level of growth in supply chain um how much what's happening from that so front? one of the fundamental principles in supply chain design is uh data and material are fungible mm. okay i can replace material with data mm. what do i mean by that uh let's say i have a store okay and i have to stock some items mobile phones so let's say i'm putting these mobile phones there i don't know saujanya is walking into this thing i don't know whether she's going to buy a red one or a blue one or what so i have to keep all of them if i knew what you're going to buy and when you're going to buy it and make sure just that is over there okay you may not even have to come to the store i will give it to you at that point right but i don't know at this point i don't have that information so i have to keep a lot mm. now you translate this you know extend this way backwards um because of that i have to keep Stop parts it. of all different levels right. my suppliers don't know what i'm going to order so they keep multiple stocks so everybody down the chain keeps buffering and buffering and buffering because they don't know the better the information flow the less stuff you've got to make and store uh, and it's also much more environmentally friendly than if i know if i had perfect knowledge everything will be exactly one piece going through manufacturing has not been so 
the, the Japanese showed us in the 80s that you can do what they call single piece uh, yeah. manufacturing on an assembly line. They were doing it for motorcycles to yeah. start with. So if you can do manufacturing as single piece, not batches of stuff, you can do most things with very small quantities. Only problem is you don't know what to make. Okay. So you're right. Information is crucial. And that information is not only demand signal. Uh, many, many items that come in, let's say I am, uh, I am buying uh, a wheat produced to make some product. Or I'm buying castings to, to make, you know, engine blocks for my cylinders. Some of them will have defects in them. Mm. How many defects will there be? I don't know. So what do I do? I buy more. Okay, so I am again buffering because I don't know the knowledge. The wheat I get in, I don't know what the grade of the wheat exactly is. So I buy more in case it's not. So everywhere we, we because of lack of perfect knowledge, we buffer. The better the knowledge the less we need to, less capacity, less quantity, everything comes down in there. So you're right. Information is crucial in the supply chain. Most supply chain problems are actually caused by information failures, not because of anything else. In there. Because if I have a machine that makes something, it'll keep making something. Hmm. It's It may break down, but those kind of problems most factories know how to manage without allowing it to break down. What they can't do is figure out what the customer going to make hmm. or want. Mm. That's where the challenge comes. And earlier, when customers didn't have a choice, you could make anything you want, they'll buy it. Now they have a choice, so they say, no, I, I don't want this, I'll go next door and buy something else. You know. So then you say, oops, don't let that happen. Put everything possible in front of the customer. So what you're also saying is, if I'm in this space, and if I'm anybody worth a, a dime in this space, I need to understand customer behaviors. Yes. I need to understand regulations and, you know, some of these inhibitors and drivers that are potentially there. I need to have an integrated data information available, which will allow me to make the right decisions. And on the industrial front, I need to have like a Six Sigma sort of quality um, process, which most manufacturing companies have already imbibed on but take that on to the other supply chain spaces as well and then you're sort of creating a very sustainable repeatable model which is inclusive whether it is in agriculture or any space and the, also the right talent to actually drive this. exactly i was just going to add an engineering knowledge is also crucial mm. in this i can have all the other things but if i don't have a knowledge of how exactly to make this mm. okay or how exactly can i improve this mm. which is essentially an engineering task um i will still end up you know i'll have i wish i could do it mm. but i can't actually realize it mm. over there so we do need good engineers also incidentally uh, there was a uh, there was a report i was seeing just the other day it was published last month which was looking at uh in the us is your college degree worth it? Mm. And the way they did it was, it was a very deep statistical study. It evaluates how much more would you earn in your lifetime because of the college degree versus not having it. Very and it uh, it ranked this across some 13,000 colleges, 30,000 courses mm. in them, and does it one by one, it tells you. And then it may say, if you've done this particular degree in this college, the median value of your lifetime earnings is probably going to be $200,000 more than if you had no college degree. Mm. Interestingly, uh, in that, engineering was very high. Okay, It was very high. Um, engineering uh, and not including uh, computer science. Okay, This is, this is uh, what do you call it? physical engineering mm. stuff. Mm. Um, and... Uh, in the US, they had a significant number which had a negative return. Okay, in the sense that you're going to college actually resulted in you earning less over your lifetime than you would have done otherwise, because they also took costs into account mm. into that. But engineering is a very important subject for us now. And uh, it's an asset we have, isn't it? As a country. Uh, yes and no. See, we produce a lot of engineers. Mm. 
many of them are not really engineers okay uh, they've just got a degree uh, in of late the real engineers have actually been doing well because you're seeing a lot more innovation happening the real product innovation <coughs> Uh, whereas uh, earlier most of them were just let me go through this and then either I go get into the software industry and forget about my engineering mm. or I go into management and forget about my engineering because I never really liked it I just I had to do it kind of a thing but getting in engineers who actually do engineering is uh, is a uh, important capability to build we have some great ones that's why you're seeing a lot of for example, you take the EV space. Mm. There's so many startups coming up. How can they come up if you don't have <laughs> people who are doing engineering in this? So there are many, many product categories where there's a lot of real engineering that's happening. In them. That's, that's very good. And I suspect once you make engineering sexy, like we talked about supply chain, uh, the more people will shift into that and take it seriously. Right now they see it's probably better for me to get a job in a software company. Any closing comments? I think supply chain is a, it's got to come out from, you know, uh, most of the people in supply chain are quiet, self-effacing, you know, they're background people in a way in this. Um, but I think increasingly it has got to become a little bit more upfront and more confident. Uh, it needs people who can pitch it, you know, within companies as well as across this. And... Um, being able to advocate what supply chains can do will actually make it better for younger people to understand what the opportunities are. The strange thing is, even 10 years ago, supply chain professionals, when we would do job surveys to set <coughs> salary levels, so even 10 years ago, when we would do job surveys to set salary levels for you know things like annual increments and so on and so forth, you'd get a mean mean job value and then you'd have positive and negative variations, mm. premiums or discounts. Supply chain was always positive. It mm. was always at a premium. Over sales, over marketing, oh. over this. Yes. Okay. Even 10 years ago, it was, it was a scarce skill. Okay. Um, it was not a, it's not publicly seen, but it was always a hot skill. If you had good supply chain capabilities. Look at it like this. One or two people in a large organization mm -hmm. can alter the entire profitability structure of that company. Right? Why would you not pay them? Okay. And if you have good supply chain people all the way down in your pyramid, your company, you talked about how Asian Paints has got a great reputation. They, they invested in that right from the beginning in this. So you, you have good supply chain people all up and down, your company's capabilities become that much better. And when your capability is better, you can be strategically more ambitious. Mm. Okay, because the more capable I am, the bigger goals I can set for myself. If I if I don't have the capability, I have to set modest goals. And, sure. and so I think that uh, getting more publicity to what supply chain actually does, impacts, and how actually fascinating it can be as a subject will actually encourage more people to look at this. And like I said earlier, a lot of colleges are now offering this because they've realized that there's a demand for it in the marketplace. So I would encourage a, a lot of youngsters to take a look at this. I think it's a great opportunity for them and it's going to be a, it's going to be a space where there's a lot of change that's going to happen. Okay, there's this mesh of... Uh, technology, engineering, and all kinds of innovation and opportunity. It's going to be a fascinating place to be. Alugu, it's lovely talking to you. Thank I you. hope you enjoyed this as good much fun. as I did. Um, very informative. I've learned so much. And uh, thank you so much for making time and being a guest in my show. Thank you. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.